Uh, so yes, I'm Shane Israelman. We're here to moderate the lightning talks. And what are the lightning talks, especially this time? I know, it's very, very complicated. So let me actually get you through the set of rules. There's about 10 of them, and I think you know, we need to start from the beginning, right? Yeah, and of course we start with zero because we're programmers, so. Exactly. Uh, so rule number zero, you have to get on stage. Rule number one, you have to get off stage in how many minutes? Uh, less than four minutes because we don't want to get between you and your coffee. Exactly. Rule number three, you have to talk about something that is relevant to the Apache Software Foundation or one of our communities, or yes. something that is relevant to you, but it still might be enjoyable by the rest of the attendees. This, this is a lot of rules. We, we have some special cases. Well, I yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm just getting started. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I, I think people are going to want their coffee. I think we need to have more of an example. Do you have a good example in mind? Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just change. This is, you know, we do this at Apache sometimes. I'm just going to change the agenda, and I'm going to give the first lightning talk as an example to show you how quick we can go through these with one idea, one great idea we want to get across. So that's okay. okay. That sounds good to me. You want to start timing? You've got exactly four minutes. Take okay. Wait. So, hey, Roman, knock, knock. Who's there? Ak. Ak who? Gesundheit. Okay, oh, well, that's, that's the perfect reaction for a dad joke. So, but it got across the point. We had a little bit of humor in the morning to, get, to keep us going, and uh, you know something simple to think about good health. So, good yeah. health to you. Good health to everyone. Um, so, what else? <laughs> well, I think that's about it in terms of uh, the lightning talks this time. We do allow. Normally, we don't allow slides, but we do allow slides this time. Um, and I think we should actually go on to the first speaker before. All right. We awesome. So uh, I actually have a question for you. So how is your digital footprint doing, Shane? Do you have a digital footprint? Um, you know, I've thought about this, and no, I keep purely analog footprint. So I have no digital footprint. Okay, no batteries in here. I, on the other hand, as a recovering black hat, used to have a lot of the digital footprint in some of the unsavory places, so I do care about my digital footprint. And in fact, I actually care about your digital footprint as well. And that's why our first speaker, Dirk, who will be talking about wax that is hot, I think, and how to protect our public and private digital spaces. So let me welcome Dirk on stage. Uh, do we have an extra mic yeah. for him? Okay. All right, do I get the timer as well? I will keep time. You will keep timer, all right, okay. <laughs> so really what I, talk, what I want to talk about is red wax, sort of like, the sort of like seeding wax you sort of like use. And, and really sort of like what this is about, it's sort of like actually red wax, redwax.eu is actually sort of like an open source project. Uh, Graham Leggett and I sort of like have started a few years ago. Um, but I don't really want to talk directly about technology in that. Um, it is about trust, it's about security, it is about, about sort of like why trust where you can verify about transparency. But really what it is about is about this problem we have in technology that um, very often sort of like when we build systems, we build architecture, like for example the examples we saw today in the cities in Kenya and so on, there is a tendency that our architecture, our technology, that it follows somehow um, the organization, the politics, the world in we, which we live. So our architecture is not some sort of like beautiful thing we've constructed. It's actually sort of like usually the organization is reflected in it. The powers around us are reflected in our technology. The politics is reflected in it. The graft, the corruption, all these sort of like problems sort of like reappear in our architecture because very often sort of like we sort of like don't really have a free hand to, to sort of like build these things. They're simply sort of like, they sort of like come into existence in that world. And very often, sort of like, you would like to sort of like sometimes turn those things around because the opposite is also true. If certain sort of like architecture, certain technologies only allow ID cards, for example, to be sort of like issued with fingerprints or not with fingerprints, and, and some people have those worn off, then also that technology starts to influence sort of like the organization that can carry the things, the structures it can make. So basically, what we're trying to do with RedRex is sort of like break through a lot of that. And Obviously, of course, we have technology, so we're sort of searching for technical places where we can solve that. And one of the things we've noticed over the years is that around security, safety, privacy, trust, um, there is a tendency that our solutions sort of like impose things on the world. We get big centralized uh, certificate authorities. We get all sorts of things which sort of like are very lumpy, and they sort of like start to determine how we do things. We have like wonderful code bases like OpenSSL, but if you sort of like look under the cover, it's absolutely enormous. And if you sort of like see, look at the way we sort of like configure that, like if you, for example, even take something as old and ancient and crufty as the Apache web server, I mean, 
configuring as Zell and that is actually sort of like a complex thing with sort of like many lines and statements and different rules and cryptography things and so on. So what we're trying to do in Redwax is actually break all that up in very, very small pieces and actually give each of those pieces sort of like a good common industry, good practice sort of like way of, of, of doing it. So there's actually only one way of doing it and sort of like what is considered good industry practice. And we can sort of like keep that on as sort of like standards mature quite easily. So rather than sort of like when you choose to do certain things, sort of like be forced to adapt your architecture, you sort of like thing to basically that, that environment you're in, you sort of like have sort of like much smaller building blocks to sort of like play with freely, to sign things, to, for example, bring out a timestamp and put a little signature on that, to encrypt a small thing, to sort of like basically preserve a little bit of privacy. And so sort of like our hope sort of like is that, that as we sort of like like free web sort of like of having these very very small parts in there we sort of like start to claw back some of these sort of like very big systems where sort of like the, the world they've shaped and the world that shapes them sort of like can be broken up a little bit and we get like smaller bits so we can sort of like start to sort of like re re rebuild newer smaller things at a smaller scale and basically sort of like bring that public digital space sort of like closer again sort of like to a sort of like to build it the way we want to do it. So if you're interested, if you're curious, go to redwax.eu sort of like for some of the first, very first source code uh, to be there and expect sort of like to, to sort of like see me talking about this in the, in the years coming because it's something very, very dear to my heart to sort of like reclaim that digital space to make it a personal thing again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. That, by the way, was impressively on time. Um, Yes, de yes, thank you, Dirk. Thank you for getting us all closer to coffee and keeping us, and that's a perfect segue from the earlier talks that I, I hadn't even realized how close that was. And um, so we have another speaker coming up. I have a little bit of a problem with the next talk. Um, you towards do? An attribute, yeah, towards an attribute-based, role-based access control. So role-based, I don't understand this. That's a mouthful. I mean, what is it about even? Yeah, and, it, and, and if, you're, if you're basing your access to roles, when are we going to start basing access to bread? You know, crackers. I know. I'm, I'm having a hard time with this one, but let's have Sean come up. And could we get the uh, slides from the, um, from the website? Slides from the, 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 this here? We have slides. Um, talk about the Sean McKinney role-based access control systems. Yeah. Uh, and the no, time starts now. Not, not those kind of roles, Shane. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Am I starting yet? Because I want to try to get these slides going. Okay, so uh, as we said, towards an attribute-based, rule-based access control system. So I'm an RBAC guy. Um, I really like the specification. It's uh, very useful. A lot of people use it. It's uh, concise. It's elegant. It describes the shape of the data. It describes the shape of the, of the APIs. But there's a, a really big problem with it, and that's a problem of context, which is as soon as you put context into the decision, we get this sort of explosion of roles. So what do I mean by that? So let's take an example. So we have a few roles here, and we have uh, a bit of context, which would be the customer right there. And so as soon as you try to add, say you want to say, well, I want to give Bob access to that uh, page or that role number one, but only when he's acting on behalf of customer four, five, six, then you run into this explosion of roles and it's actually uh, a linear increase. So um, you end up with the number of roles, which is the number of roles times the number of values of context. So if you have three customers, that's fine. You only have nine roles, but what if you have a thousand customers and you end up with 3,000 roles, what if it's 100,000 customers, you have you know, even more. So what do we do about that? Well, a lot of people would point you to attribute-based access control and tell you uh, to use that. Instead, role-based access control is dead, don't use it, and it's actually a pretty interesting idea. Attributes are, um, it allows you to, in that kind of uh, context, a, uh, a role just becomes another attribute. And so you can assign these attributes directly to the subject and you can do your, access, your policies based on that. And it's kind of nice, except there's a bit of a problem with that and that's a problem of complexity. So a typical attribute-based access control system is uh, quite hard to implement. It's not readily available 
via, say, an open source provider. You can't really find them out here. There's not a, an ABAC system in Apache right now. And so what do you do? You got to pay somebody a lot of money to implement, which is quite a large barrier for small companies and small governments, and they can't do it. So I'm proposing a solution, which is to say, let's keep our back, but let's sprinkle a bit of attributes into the decision. How do we do that? So it's in, in, in role-based access control, you have what's called a role activation phase, where um, just because that role is assigned doesn't necessarily mean that that role is going to be activated in the session. So what does that do for us? Well, let's take an example. We've got here a couple roles. We've got a teller and we've got a coin washer, and we're going to uh, introduce a bit of context in this case, which is location. So we got a few users. We're going to say, yeah, Curly, he's a coin washer in the north, and he's a coin washer in the south, but he's a teller only in the east. And, uh, you know, Mo is a teller in the north and south, and so on and so forth. And so that means that the role becomes kind of special, that the access control policy engine has to identify that role during the activation phase and say, whoa, I need to look at this context. I can't just automatically activate it. And it also means that you have to store that bit of context on the user entry as well. So no problem, we have this, I got this screenshot from this uh, Apache Fortress solution. You can see we have Curly, and he has, say for example, he's a teller in the east, and he's a washer in the north and the south. Great, so what does the code look like? Um, here you can see that I've run out of time. So I'm going to... Try to stop that. Stupid it still problem. counts as time. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just real quick, at, at runtime, when you're establishing the session, you would push the context in to the runtime. And so in this case, we have, we're saying we're in the location north. So in that case, Curly would just activate as a washer. And so it's all quite easy. and. We, we actually have that in Apache Fortress. If you're interested, check out that project, which is a role-based access control system, or you can check out these examples, or come talk to me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Well, I've got to say, now I actually understand it better. So I guess lightning talks help. Yes, they certainly do. And I'm also getting hungry. Mm, I have a question for you, though. You look yes. like a very fashionable guy. You know, just well, look, well, thank like, just thank look, look, look at Shane, right? Uh, okay, and, and what's the and question? And the question is, do you actually have the same sense of fashion in your socks? Uh, no, I do not. I do, and that's why the speaker gift was just such a heartwarming gift for me. But our next lighting talk, we'll be talking about how can we get shirts, socks, or anything that's swag for Apache projects. So Apache Schwag, can we get you on stage? Mark? Mark is Mark in the audience? Yes, Mark yes, is in the audience. Mark. And here he even has a slide. Excellent, thank you. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the community development project essentially provides a service for any project that wants it to set up a swag store on redbubble.com. So if your project wants to be able to buy your project logo on shower curtains, clocks, or even t-shirts, then drop us an email at dev at community.apache.org and we will get your project set up on Redbubble. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow, that was a lightning talk. That is talk. the quickest and most affecting, affected, affecting uh, lightning talk I've ever seen. Uh, do we have anything else, Shane? Uh, yes, we do. We have um, one more talk about industrial IoT, which I'm actually kind of excited about. Oh, that makes two of us. I mean, IoT is getting to be a big thing. And, um, you know, but the, all the devices are kind of, they're little, just little chips on boards, like industrial IoT. So like, it's going to be like transformers. Oh, right, no, with I the think sensors or something? Maybe. Like adding but we have a things. perfect person So we have Julian. We need to find his slides us. here. Um, uh, talking about industrial IoT at Apache. Yeah. OK, well, I guess we figured out. Let's see. This one should be. Oh, yeah, here it is. Excellent. Uh, this should. Excellent. Excellent. 
So, hello, thank you very much. I, the title of my talk is Industrial IoT at Apache. So I want to give you a very quick overview on what kind of projects we have into this industrial IoT area, what I mean by that, and also try to give you a short distinguishing between um, the Eclipse Foundation and how they do it. So let's enter with something which is probably unusual for someone standing on the keynote uh, stage and saying that there's something he likes better about the Eclipse Foundation than the ASF. <laughs> Sorry for that, yeah. Um, they have this concept of their sub-communities, I don't know how they call it exactly, but they, especially in the IoT area, they're very active. They have about 40, uh, 40 projects in the IoT area for gateways, cloud platforms, all that kind of stuff. But this is mostly custom IoT. And uh, to save some time and go to the cool, cool devices as uh, Roman and uh, Shane wished, um, I want to show you what we mean with industriality. Those are the real things. So this is the internet of real things. We have machines that weigh tons. This machine on the left weighs 50 tons probably. And by using Apache PLC for X, we're able to communicate with the machine. We could even control the machine, but this is seriously dangerous. Um, but we get data out of it um, and can analyze whatever it does. And this is, of course, way cooler than a smartwatch or something because, well, it's a real machine. It's uh, loud and heavy and probably also a bit smelly. Um, so to, to kind of wind up, um, here are three projects, uh, two of them incubating. Um, to, to give you a short overview about the small industrial IoT community we have, so we have PLC4X, basically we used to fetch data out of those machines, communicate with this kind of machines, um, with their native protocols. We have Apache Edge, and which is for data processing, data routing, um, and we have IoTDB, which is uh, the new hot shit to store the time series data we get out of those machines, thousands of uh, measurements each second. Um, and because we like this concept of this IoT subgroup, we, we uh, made a proposal to get a mailing list, which is not for a project, but a ASF-wide mailing list, um, which is IoT at Apache.org. And uh, as my last lightning talk in Las Vegas, let me close this up uh, with the words, you want to subscribe to uh, IoT at Apache.org. So thank you very much and hope to see you on list. Thank you so much. <clears throat> That is awesome. OK, I've got a question for our audience. Do you guys want to hear one more lightning talk? Awesome. So I think we've got one more. Well, I think we actually should go for towards coffee, because. No, but the audience. But the, but the audience. Yes, no. But the audience, the wish you're, of the you're, community. You're willing, it's you're willing? the community over lunch. I mean, that's the Apache rule. OK, isn't it? OK. Uh, so let me, let me introduce the next lightning talk. Uh, and I think you know this speaker is somewhere in the audience. But I'll give you three clues to guess who that is. So that person is about to turn 20 years at Apache today, tomorrow, in a few days. Can you, can you guess who that is? Um, no, this is a surprise guess to me. OK. Um, I'm trying to open their slides that I can see here, but I'm having a hard time that with the German. That person, as far as I remember, has a lot of ideas about you know, how to organize Apache communities and might even run a website explaining this idea of an Apache way or something still. Maybe somebody from the audience? Not ring the bell. OK, it doesn't ring the bell. OK, final clue before, before we invite the speaker on stage. I think this speaker has an enormous love for cats. Still doesn't. Really? Doesn't I mean, there are a lot of us who love cats. That's about half of why the internet was invented, wasn't it? OK, my final clue, a really good fashion sense. Oh, OK, I know, I know. Yes. So let me introduce to you our last speaker uh, of the day. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. It's me? you. It's me? you. Oh, no, I love it your shirt. You. That's like so know, crisp. It is, it is awesome shirt, but it is you, Shane. So Can we get the slides back on for the machine, please? Uh, this is the last clue. So uh, I will do a, an abbreviated version of my lightning talk, and I'll talk like the FedEx announcer and go really, really fast. OK, sorry, that's a little bit too fast. Five things you might not know about Apache. So does Apache have a URL shortening service? Why, yes, we do. We have our very own. It's called s.apache.org. And if you are a committer, you can shorten your URLs using our service, which is the website up here. Why is that important? Because who knows how long bit.ly, for example, will be around, because .ly is the domain name for Libya. Apache.org 
will be around for the next 50 years, and we will guarantee that your URLs will stay shortened. Uh, number one, what is a PMC? It's a project management committee. So they are the people who vote on releases, and they are the people who vote to add new committers to projects. That's really the, the base thing. Um, they're also a formal part of the ASF, and they're sort of how we have our legal shield protecting people when we make releases. And again, of course, as you can see here, s.apache.org, I'll, I'll post these slides online, um, s.apache.org slash about dash PMC, and you will find the answer to this question. So number two, how do I become an Apache member or get a seat on the board? Now, we don't always get seats, okay, but still, there's no one answer. This is a big question. Really, it's use the Apache way to serve the public good. That's why we're here, to give away our software to help people. And membership in the foundation itself is recognized by people who are working on multiple projects, who are doing a bigger thing than simply the one thing they're doing maybe with their day job or their code. Um, and importantly, Apache governance is always independent. So unlike some other foundations, um, which do excellent work, we always have purely independent directors. There is no way that a company could buy a seat or otherwise influence the board at Apache. We are just, we're built to defend against that. So I, we have an excellent essay here at about independence. Number three, what, well, what is an Apache member? I've just been talking about that. It's probably not really what you think. Um, if you're a committer, thank you. We love all the code you're contributing. Uh, being a member is kind of like being a committer to the legal corporation behind the scenes. And um, it's mostly the annual meeting. We have an annual meeting where we have a shareholder meeting. We vote on the board and, and go through an agenda that's very old-fashioned. Um, so that's not very interesting. What is interesting is members have visibility into all projects. So while members can't contribute to a project necessarily, unless they are committer there, they can discuss things with any project. So how can I be successful at Apache? This is something we can't, if we gave 10 talks, we couldn't help everybody with because everybody has their own story. So there are a number of people who've written some great success at Apache, their own story, how they got here, which is at this link and is also on the blogs.apache.org website. And number five, which I find popular, how do I get in for things for my project? Like you want uh, another JIRA, you want more CI cap capacity. Well, you have to ask for them. And it's a tip, ask politely, and the Enver team really likes ponies. Uh, and, and gnomes are, are bad. Gnomes are the people who break things. So, um, and number six, is how do I get Shane off stage? Because I'm up here, I'm having a great time, right? I think I'm being, well, not as funny as I usually am, but uh, not too bad. I think you're about and to start talking about cats. I would love cats. to cats, talk right? about, cats, yes, cats. my two cats, uh, Palinka and Toke. We have more cats at home, but these are the most um, uh, photogenic ones. Uh, Palinka and Toke named after Hungarian liqueurs. G get okay, thank this. you, thank you. Exactly, <laughs> I was waiting for that. All right, thank you so much. That's all we've got. All right, thank you, Rowan and, and Shane.